Hello. Josh. I'm back. Uh, yeah, right. it is. <clears throat> oh, we're live. <laughs> 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 I have no idea what you guys have seen I said so we're far. live. Thank I, you so much for tuning into this episode of Riverdent Radio. My name is Josh Just getting here. Lewis. We have a really exciting episode today talking about the Desert Fathers. I've got Josh Hoffer on the other line. Yeah. It's going to be exciting. We're going to talk about who they were, what they believed, what was helpful. And where did and they live? Not helpful. Where, who, where, what, when, and why. The desert. In this episode, it's going to be exciting talking about hot and sweaty desert. Speaking of which, did we leave the AC on? Because it is, I'm not feeling it. It is hot. It is smoky. Yes. Um, I have got a really cool, this is super cool, Deacon James is in the studio with us uh, today. Y'all will know him as Barely Protestant. A really cool. Dawson is back here. He does the research of the show, and uh, they're just hanging out with us today in studio. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, sorry for the interruption for some of you who are live, but we've got a really, really cool episode today. If you're not familiar with Remnant Radio, we are a theology broadcast. Uh, we interview pastors and teachers from all over the world every single Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, and due to corona, we've had quite a bit more interviews. Uh, so we invite these guys on the show. We don't always agree with them. Sometimes we disagree with them. Sometimes we agree with them. But our ultimate goal is to challenge our presuppositions as we're looking at the scriptures so we can better understand God's word and better understand the God who has given us his word. To my left, your right, is the infamous Michael Roundtree. So infamous. I mean, he's becoming quite quite, yeah. quite pronounced, with or without a beard. People know you. <laughs> I know. Uh, you never know. Like, if I just shave a little bit too much, the whole thing's coming off because it almost comes off just with one mistake. Yeah, I've seen him. I've seen him uh, uh, take a nap and sleep too hard on his pillow and wake up, and there's <laughs> yeah, just no beard. Yeah, there's nothing left, yeah. like on one side of my face. So. Tell us, Michael, about some of the shows that we've been producing and some of the shoes that sh- shoes, shoes that we have to look forward to. Okay, well, uh, last week was a packed week because it was my first week back from vacation. That's we right. had four shows. Uh, we had William Lane Craig on Wednesday with Atonement Theory, talked about penal substitutionary atonement, has a book on the atonement uh, that just came out. And it was a powerful episode and uh, really robust. I mean, really dove into the subject. And so um, definitely want to check that out with Dr. William Lane Craig. We also had Jimmy Evans, uh, mm-hmm. Pastor Jimmy Evans from Gateway Church, talking about the pre-tribulation rapture. He told us before the show, ask me anything, try to stump me. So Josh and I came with our best, and he had an answer for everything. And so whatever side that you're on, uh, you'll you'll definitely, like, we, we went for it. We Anyway, it was a good, good interview. Yeah. And uh, we had John Thomas from Streams Ministry, John Paul Jackson's ministry. John Paul Jackson passed away a few years ago. That's actually John how Thomas. we know Josh. He's, he's coming on the show today. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So uh, anyway, but John Thomas with Streams Ministry. I didn't know that. So Yeah, yeah. It was actually at a conference, John Thomas conference that Remnant Radio came out and filmed. We filmed all the speakers afterward. Josh was one of them that was there. Ah. So that's how I first got to meet Josh uh, from that ministry. Super cool ministry. Uh, yeah, super, super thrilled to have Josh on the show. Yeah. But but uh, finish that out. Sorry. Okay. I have got a couple more. Anyway, well, coming up next week, uh, we have Monday night, Knowing God's Will. That's right. So... Kind of a frequently, like, as a pastor, that's one of my most frequently asked questions. So, that's right. And then uh, tomorrow, we have a small group of us. Dawson's going to be with that's us. That's right. Michael's going to be with us. Michael Miller's going to be with us. And Michael Roundtree may or may not be with us. I haven't, I I haven't got a con- confirm- confirmation. But we're going to be talking about authority, uh, specifically, like, the kind of ways that authority works out throughout the church. Some churches hold to ecumenical agreement. Other churches will hold to, like, a, a papacy, like, what, what does the priesthood say about authority? And other groups say, hey, Scripture alone is our authority. And how does that flesh out in the Protestant Reformation? How did that come about? And then how do we look to the Protestant Reformation today to inform our life and authority? So it's going to be a really cool episode. We've been cranking out episodes as if our salvation depended on it. It's been, it's been pretty intense. Yeah. I've been thrilled. So you guys make sure to subscribe and like because we're interviewing everybody up in here. Hide oh, you, yeah. Hide your theologians. Hide, hide them all. Because we coming up and interviewing all of them. <laughs> y'all caught that reference. I'm glad. I'm glad y'all caught that. Okay. Um, anyway, Josh, tell us about yourself and your ministry uh, before we just digress into a, 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 a hi spiral hi of, hi of, of, of you know, a spiral of witty uh, one-liners, social talking points. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. History of memes or something. We'll go. Tell over. us about yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yourself. Well, um, I, I'm Josh Hofford. Uh, I live in Canada on the east coast of Canada in uh, Prince Edward Island, smallest province in Canada, uh, and the smallest city of the smallest province of Canada as well. Um, Uh, And I'm originally... I see you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) 14,000 people. We moved from... Well, we moved from Vancouver, which is a large city, to Summerside, Prince Edward Island, which is 
almost one of the smallest cities in Canada. Does anyone live there? Uh, a couple people live here, but uh, it, you're, you're it's going a full on Desert Father Canada style, aren't you? <laughs> I, well, you know, I didn't think fathers. about that when I was coming here, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ever since this live episode like went like broke up at the beginning, we're, we've gone goofy. We're way too goofy because there's only have two responses. You can like get super depressed and emo for the rest of the episode, <laughs> or just lose it. Sorry, I choose to lose it. So 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 again, you, you're out there in the the proverbial uh, winter desert. Yes, that's very true. Yes, we've got. Uh, well, we're right now in in summer, so okay, we've got about um, four more weeks left. So <laughs> maybe six if we're lucky. <laughs> And uh, then then the uh, weather starts going cold again. So I'm and oh. I mean, you can hear my heart. I'm from California originally from the coast of California. So moving to the proverbial winter desert is uh, uh, has been interesting for sure. Uh, so anyway, I, I ran I I originally moved up to I was raised going to vineyard churches. It was impacted by John Paul Jackson, who you had men, who you had mentioned uh, when my church in California had hosted some of the uh, training that John Paul offered. And I eventually ended up moving up to Canada where they were opening a training school location, an intern program location in Vancouver. Uh, met my wife there, um, you know, kind of your typical ministry school story, I guess. And uh, got married, started having kids, was running the Canadian branch eventually in 2012, was running the Canadian branch of John Paul's ministry, Streams. Ran that for five years. Naturally, him passing away uh, in 2015 had really shifted the focus and what the ministry was doing and how we were adjusting and all that. So uh, eventually, at the end of 2017, we closed that ministry down, and my wife and I moved to the East Coast and launched Wind Ministries. Uh, so that's presently, um, as of 2018, we launched Wind Ministries, and that's the ministry that we run. And we do anything from I mean, talking about the early church fathers, um, I, I mean, a significant portion of what the ministry is based on is the teachings of the Desert Fathers. And so I, I studied through 52 um, individual Desert Fathers and then wrote articles for them and, and just trying to understand how they practiced the spiritual life. That was really the, some of the stories and then how they practiced the spiritual life. So we recently launched a podcast called Silent Fire, where um, I'm my friend, an Anglican priest, and I sit down and we talk about m the, how I grew up as a charismatic and how he grew up. He grew up Roman Catholic and then eventually became Anglican. Um, and just how our, our journeys of understanding life in God and experiencing God, where those places intersect, and we're just trying to have conversations with people um, uh, primarily centered right now in Eastern Canada on what does it look like to experience God and how do we talk about that um, cross denominationally, and um, rather What's than the name fighting, of that podcast, Josh, tell us again. Uh, Silent Fire. So if you search Silent on Fire. YouTube, Silent Fire, uh, we've got we're we're just getting started out. So there's it's a quiet know. podcast, but um, <laughs> it's it's hot. It's good stuff. So so Josh, uh, just kind of like lead into this. Why why the Desert Fathers? Why why was that piquing your interest? I mean, I can only assume being in the John Paul Jackson, you know, uh, streams ministry, that there was such an emphasis on the prophetic. And I would mm -hmm. imagine that um, there, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of speaking for you here. I don't know if this is the case, but like, was there a desire to like root into history? Because there's so many claims that like, you know, the charismatic movement started at Azusa Street, right? And sure, it hasn't, of course. It, that, that's where it happened. Which is so yeah. not true. It's not, so not no, not as true, not true at all. It's, it's the idea, but, but, but was that part of your inspiration looking to the Desert Fathers? Was it to, to root the charismatic expression within a historic faith? I not I don't know that originally it was, but I discovered that. Yeah. Um, mm. I think originally I've I have always appreciated history. Um, and when I when I first when I my parents divorced when I was 18, so that kind of sent me careening for a few years. Mm. When I came back and and really started exploring life in Jesus, I was about 25. Um, and the first few books that my my father gave me to read when I expressed an interest uh, was F.F. Uh, F. Bruce's the spreading, flame, the spreading Flame and New Testament History uh, and J.N.D. Kelly's Early Christian Doctrine. Uh, and those three, like, I didn't know anything. And that's, he just handed me these and said, these Everyone are Everyone in the studio is start. shaking their head like, that's a good dad. That's a good <laughs> dad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. My yeah I, I, he, if I had questions, he wouldn't answer. He would just kind of give a vague answer. And then say, well, maybe you want to look at this book in the Bible, or maybe you want to read this uh, particular mm -hmm. author. He'd just point me in the way to find the answer. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and so the answers became my answers. But that really rooted a love of early church history in me was very foundationally to my Christian walk. Um, and so I, I just kind of started studying more and reading a little bit more. And then I got involved with John Paul Jackson's ministry. Uh, and, and he kept referencing, um, especially in one of his main courses called The Art of Hearing God. Um, and I know you guys, I watched the episode with John on uh, just the other day. John's, a, of course, a very good mutual friend. Uh, and I taught that course a lot with John as well. But uh, John Paul was talking about the dark night of the soul. And so in talking about the dark night of the soul, I realized the way that I think was, well, that's nice that John Paul's teaching about the dark night of the soul, but what did the guy who wrote the book, The Dark Night of the Soul, have to say? Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I went and I picked up The Dark Night of the Soul book by John of the Cross and then just kind of started exploring some of this contemplative literature and over time kept hearing references to the Desert Fathers uh, and eventually picked, picked up, um, and I can flash this book here for you, the Sayings mm -hmm. of the Desert Fathers, which is kind of the um, traditional collection of wisdom sayings by the Desert Fathers, and uh, and and started studying more and more early church history as I as I dove into the Desert Fathers as well, um, okay. and saw just how rooted. Well, the, the language I saw being used by the early church fathers when it came to the spiritual life and the Desert Fathers, I was just going, I've experienced that. Yeah. That makes sense to me. And, and then, of course, I started reading stuff like Augustine's on the Trinity and, and uh, Athanasius on not, on not Three Gods and, and stuff like that and going, my goodness, how come, how come I was never taught this stuff growing up? How come this was never part of my church culture? Because it was, it, mm -hmm. and, I mean, I love vineyard churches, but it was very much that Pentecost started at Azusa Street. That's right. And right. Uh, tongues and all that kind of stuff. And, <clears throat> and I just found such a robust expression of the spiritual life and and especially the flow and operation of spiritual gifts um, in the early church and then throughout church history that I thought um, we've just been missing something. And uh -huh. so the initial the initial push to start studying and writing about the Desert Fathers was just to help. I was hoping to introduce people to something that I'd always missed and and had found. You know, I don't want to say later in my walk with Jesus because it's been ten or fifteen years, but that I I um, I wish I would have found earlier. Uh -huh. uh, or at least would have known, hey, this, this didn't just start 100 years ago, but this has been part of common Christian experience throughout history. Hmm. So I've, I've heard you mention several things, each of which could be its own jumping in point. We, I've heard you mention contemplative prayer. I've heard you, uh, heard you mention uh, just prophetic and spiritual gifts. Uh, we've talked about the dark night of the soul and then prophetic and spiritual gifts. So there's lots of jumping in points. But before we go too deep, uh, just for our viewers who literally don't even know who are the Desert Fathers? Why am I watching this podcast? <laughs> what, it, like, okay, Desert and Fathers. Like, I guess these some guys went out to some des desert and, like, prayed a lot and prophesied to each other. Like, help us understand who these people are. Yeah, yeah. great question. Uh, the Desert Fathers, the, the uh, part of the early church fathers, um, and the Desert Fathers, essentially you're looking at a time frame from the 3rd century to about... The sixth century, though there's some leeway given there, uh, and generally the main catalyst is looked at as Anthony the Great. Um, he he would be the first real real um, individual considered a desert father, and it was really the the launching point of um, of uh, monastic monastic rhythm and monastic tradition within Christian history. Um, so essentially the, the beginning story, Anthony the Great, his parents pass away. Um, he's, he's 18 years old. He's received this huge inheritance because he's in a wealthy family. And um, he, he walks into a church and hears the words of Christ preached that say to the rich young ruler, go and sell all your possessions and come and follow me. So that's exactly what he did. He, I mean, the, the Holy Spirit obviously touched the moment. He sells everything, gives away everything to the poor, and goes into the desert. And, and the, the inspiration for that kind of withdrawal was uh, John the Baptist in the desert, Elijah, um, his two inaugurations into the desert, uh, and beginning his ministry in the desert, and then, of course, going to the mountain to hear God in, in the, st the still quiet whisper. Um, mm -hmm. And Jesus in his withdrawal into the desert for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. And, and that was really one of the main... Jesus and his withdrawal for the 40 days was one of the main 
inspirations for someone like Anthony. Uh, mm. Anthony spent um, uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 years. I don't remember the exact number off my off the top of my head. Yeah, and he'd have pilgrims come to him as he was uh, as he was meditating on scripture, uh, practicing what he, what would eventually be known as the disciplines of still uh, silence and solitude. The Desert Fathers didn't really talk about them as disciplines. They were just a way of life when it came to practicing the spiritual life. You just, this is just what you did. It wasn't a discipline you tried to enact. It was, if you wanted to know God, this is the, this is the way that you go. Um, and, uh, and so people would come to him for wisdom because he became renowned for wisdom and, and his ability to give instruction and guidance. Uh, and then on top of that were some of the prophetic utterances that he was known for. Uh, and the reputation that if he prayed for you, something would happen. Uh, so, so people just go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if we could, if we could maybe like, instead of at this moment, cause we'll definitely like narrow down some of those, char- those individuals, sure. just broadly speaking, the markers that identify desert fathers, yeah. one, they live in the desert, right? Uh, <laughs> being so is that they've, they kind of secluded themselves. That that's one of the greatest markers yes. of the desert fathers is that they yes. are, they're removing themselves from society yes. um, because of the distractions. It's kind of like a a fast of culture, if you will. Uh, yes. How, how, what are other markers of the Desert Fathers? What are, what are distinctives that make them not just, just general patristics? Uh, we have the early church fathers, but what makes them Desert Fathers? What, what's kind of unique about their, their pattern of belief, life, and practice? Well, the, the, I mean, the unique one is just what you said, is the withdrawal into the desert. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the withdrawal into the desert was uh, generally centered around yeah, Egypt, around Turkey, around Jerusalem. Uh, there's three main locations in Egypt, but those are the three main locations, northern Egypt, Jerusalem, and Turkey. So that's really where you find them centralized. And they, they organized themselves. Um, it, in the beginning, they organized themselves as essentially um, – hermetic lifestyles, one person isolated from, uh, all of culture, but eventually they, they developed coenobiums is what they're called, uh, monastic communities where they'd gather either around a central desert father figure. Um, and, and really it was this coalition of people practicing the spiritual life uh, with a few distinguishing characteristics when it comes to the, the disciplines that they practiced. Um, but a lot of it had to do with the, with the withdrawal, with the isolation for periods of time and with a focused gathering around communion and church expression and things like that. Um, but the, the three main locations, the, the only reason people stopped being called the desert fathers is because the teachings of the spiritual life really became broadly disseminated over time. So much so that you see eventually someone like Gregory the Great, who's kind of on the cusp of being called the Desert Father, even though he never practiced desert withdrawal. But he carries the same ethos and the same principles, uh, and he he eventually is the leader of the whole church uh, at the near the end of the sixth century. And um, while he never withdrew, he always he he essentially practiced daily solitude, daily silence. Uh, wrote the one of the um, the pastoral rule. Uh, one of the great books for um, church leadership for that influenced people for hundreds of years afterwards. Uh, so you start to see their teachings disseminate further and further and further, uh, and now you have a a, a, um, a consistent expression of monasticism throughout Christian history. Though that did shift. I mean, of course, you see uh, monastic expression later that was about um, especially stuff in uh, the uh, uh, the Middle Ages, you see some hmm. monastic expression that they wouldn't have agreed with uh, in terms of some of the the self-flagellation and stuff like that. Um, so you, but that's it. It really the shift was the 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 teachings had broadly spread, and monasticism was quite common in Christian Christianity at that time. So you mentioned the the ethos of the Desert Fathers and the and those practices that Gregory the Great shared, even though he didn't actually withdraw from society. Yeah. Now that interests me because most of us don't have the convenience of finding a desert to live in by ourselves for 30 years. So like, <laughs> what does this look like? It was for, convenient for them. It was really convenient for him to sell everything he had and go do that. 
But but my point is, like, how do we like? Okay, so I've got four kids, I've got yeah, family, I've got three, all this so. kind of crazy stuff in my life going on all the time. And so, how do I, as a believer, practice some of these principles that the Desert Fathers passed down? What does that look like? Yeah, well, that's a. It's understanding. One of the things I love about the wisdom literature of the Desert Fathers is the reasoning they give behind practicing the disciplines. So you can easily you can you can kind of disseminate them down to the principles behind why they practiced what they practiced, um, giving reasons for fasting as opposed to just say you know the the common explanation I had growing up you fast because it's the right thing to do, but what does it functionally accomplish within you? And the Desert Fathers have really good answers for those, um, you know, in terms of how they practice things. Um, so in terms of, well, the when you look at the beginning stages of the movement, this strict fasting discipline was one of the most common markers for it. And Anthony, taking Anthony in particular, Anthony barely ate anything. And he relied on pilgrims to bring him food. Um, and he's in the desert, so there's not a whole lot of water. And uh, this, was a, this was pretty common as people were inspired by his example. But by the time you get to, say, John Cassian, at the end of the fourth century, so about a hundred years removed from Anthony, by the time you get to Cassian, um, well, maybe 50, 50 to hundred years removed from uh, Anthony, there's a there's kind of a course correction that says, well, we know the early guys practiced really rigid discipline of fasting. Our recommendation is, we've seen too many people go off the rails that way. We've seen too many people um, get way too uh, obsessive. Uh, with these spiritual disciplines, with the, with the rhythm of fasting and such. And so our recommendation is that you fast until dinner and you have one meal a day and then you eat that meal in moderation. So you even see them within their own, within the, their own history attempting to discover the principle behind what some of the earlier guys taught mm -hmm. and how, what they practiced to disseminate it down to something that was way more fundamental and something that was more applicable, even though you still have people withdrawing into the desert. So to me, looking at stuff like that, that gives me license to be able to look at, okay, how do I practice silence and solitude uh, on a daily basis? And uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but one of the primary ways I was taught to pray was to put worship music on uh, and, and to kind of, quote unquote, soak in the presence of Jesus. And mm -hmm. I realized that as I started practicing silence, that worship music could be really distracting. Um, and as I practice solitude, I realized that when I was holding a book in front of me, I'm not really in solitude. I'm with the author. And so actually being able to be alone and feel that aloneness and be in silence and, and really come to grips with what my inner thought life is like is, is really what the Desert Fathers were talking about. Um, and, and so finding a common expression is I, to me has been looking at what they taught, looking at what they wrote, and then trying to identify some broad um, principles of how they organized their life. Because a lot of what they talked about um, wasn't so much theory of the nature of God or theology. It had way more to do to how to practice the spiritual life and what the effect of these various things are. So, so um, uh uh, oh, tag. Uh, we're doing. We're doing uh, go ahead. Okay. Okay. I'll, Whatever. Uh, well, Fine, dude. You're more Christian. Have it your way. Um, so, so, l <laughs> let me just pretend to be the objector here. Okay. okay. I'm hearing Good. you say like uh, these these things have benefited your life. They benefited the lives of the Desert Fathers. But what if I was going to be an objector and say, hey, part of the Christian, the responsibility of a Christian is to live in community. Right. Yep. It seems as if these people um, are trying to be absent from the world, even though Jesus told us to be a part of the world, like to to be the salt and light of the earth. They're removing right. the salt and light from the earth. And then they, they themselves are, are creating their own community that's insular and is not it's not it's not moving outward. And then they, they're removing themselves from the community of faith to be alone. So so if I was going to be the objector and say, hey, these guys seem to be teaching things that are actually flying in the face of Scripture, um, they might have had some great experiences and maybe even some profound teachings, but why should I listen to these guys since they, they seem to be going kicking against the goads of Scripture here? And I'm just trying to play the role of the, sure, the objector. Sure, of course. Yeah, and, and um, 
that would be the case if what they did for withdrawal was to escape society in the sense that I'm never going to see it again. Mm. Um, you had the, the, while the catalyst for withdrawal was the decadence in the Roman society at the time, um, the, every single one of them found themselves back in society. It wasn't like they removed themselves and then they were like, nope, I'm done with these guys. But uh, one guy in particular, a couple of different stories to illustrate the point. Um, one guy in particular named Agathon. Agathon weaves bats and bas- bats, baskets and mats. He weaves ba- he, and he goes into the city to sell them to earn a couple of dollars so he can um, buy some bread and such uh, and feed himself for the next few months. Well, Agathon comes across a man on the road who's sick as he's going into the city. So he hoists the man onto his back, brings him into the city, sells his baskets and his mats, rents an apartment, and nurses the guy back to health for four months. And then goes back to this practice of the spiritual life. And, and really with a guy like Ag- Agathon, it was um, constantly turning the heart to God while doing his work. So while he's plating uh, mats, while he's weaving baskets, he's, he's constantly praying. He's constantly searching for God, constantly reciting scripture, especially the Psalms, uh, constantly filling his mind with thoughts about God. So and, this, and, uh, go ahead. No, so this this process of isolation is a is a training ground in which yes. uh, I think of Brother Lawrence. You know, I possess God in the clamor of my kitchen, like the way I do yes. on my knees in prayer. This idea that this moment of isolation is a training ground, so that if I can possess God in silence, I can possess God in the busyness of my day. Yes. Um, and when yeah, I say possess, exactly. I'm using in the the kind of more mystical term. I mean, obviously, we we possess God as Christians. Lay in hold a sense. of. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lay hold yeah. of. That, that's good. In in our thoughts, in our minds, in our heart. Let Michael yeah. finish his question because I, I so rudely interrupted him. Oh no, it's Forgive all good. Me. Um, well, let, well, let me before Michael before let, so I can rudely interrupt you. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, I, we make I, I gotta go of it. somewhere anyway, so we, we y'all can just keep the show going. <laughs> <laughs> it's messed one up. other thing, just to just to address also because Agathon did live a life of isolation, though he came back um, into society and impacted society. You also had um, monastic communities. Uh, one in particular, uh, one story I can think in particular, um, there was a, a, a monastic community where a, a particular band of um, thieves, barbarians, had ravaged one of the cities. And so uh, a number of the people from the city had come to the monastery to receive care because their reputation was that you would care for them. And so the they, monks would cook for them. The monks would care for them. What ends up happening is one of the monks who's one of the um, he's a deacon and he's one of the notable guys in the community. People are looking up to him. He's an up and coming leader, all this stuff. He falls into sin with one of the women that's being housed at the monastery now. Uh, and so it's a real, it's a huge scandal. He ends up leaving the monastery, finding a father that will care for him and just says to the father, can I lock myself in your back room, fast and pray? Um, he's just, he's just so convicted over what's happened. So some time passes, and a um, uh, uh, a drought had hit the land, and the neighboring villages, knowing that this drought was going to ruin their next crop, decided to go to the desert fathers in this particular community and implore them to pray to God that God would send rain, because again, the desert fathers had the reputation that God would listen to them. If they prayed, something would happen. So it was mm-hmm. never like they were totally isolated and removed, that nobody was impacted by them. Uh, and, and th- as the story goes, the desert fathers come together, the fathers of this particular community come together and they, they discerned that the Lord, uh, one guy says, well, Lord spoke to me, we're to find this old man or this older brother that fell, not, not older, but fell some time ago. Uh, and they don't know where it happened to him. So, uh, they end up searching for him. They find him and they tell him if God has said that he'll only heal the land. If you pray this brother, that's been hiding out in the back room fasting and praying and just repenting for having fallen into the sin, sin with this woman. Uh, and so he prays, the land is healed. And the last statement that's made, which is one of my favorite statements in the Desert Fathers, is uh, as many people that were scandalized by his fall were blessed by his restoration, which I think, look, at that's another principle of restoration, but that's another point entirely. Uh, but there's always this, there's always this, uh, even, I mean, emperors were seeking them for counsel and advice. They'd write letters to to some of the more notable figures asking for, can you help me on this? Can you? I mean, even emperors would bring whole whole groups of people to come uh, 
receive wisdom from the desert fathers. So there was always this interplay still with culture, even though they had removed themselves from society. Mm. Okay. Uh, I want to come back to the silence thing that you talked about earlier. So there's silence and solitude. So when you're being silent before the Lord and you don't have a book or you don't have worship music going, just practically, what, what do you do? Are you thinking about the Bible? Are you thinking about the scriptures? Are you talking to God? Or are you just literally being silent and choosing not to think about anything? What does this look like for you? Yeah, what does it look great... like for the Desert Fathers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the Desert Fathers were, they generally practiced short prayers. One of the guys says, um, if the shorter the prayer, the more you've recognized your desperate need for help. And so when your house is on fire, you don't give a long-winded diatribe about help. You just go, help. And, mm -hmm. and so their, their, their point wasn't to have long crafted prayers. Their point was to have prayers as crafted by scripture. Like I said, a lot of it was based in um, reciting and repeating the Psalms and praying through the Psalms. Um, the, the, some of the later Cassian, when he laid down some of the rules for the monastic life, Cassian had 12 it, to, to say these 12 different Psalms repeatedly throughout the day. Um, and so the, the, those times of silence were always infiltrated by scripture and by prayer that was, um, inspired by scripture. So for me personally, when I'm sitting down, um, to silence, a lot of times I, I sit down, I have my, my, I have my coffee. So I don't know, you know, drinking coffee uh, makes some noise. Yeah. Praise God. That's right. Um, and, uh, I usually just start by whispering the name Jesus and thinking about the name Jesus. And one of the, mm -hmm. one of the de facto prayers of the desert fathers and the early church fathers was, uh, rooted in the prayer of the publican versus the prayer of the Pharisee was God have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, and so my, my, generally my favorite prayer is just to sit with the name of Jesus and ask God to be tender towards me, knowing that term mercy, of course, in the Old Testament being tender heartedness, is just to sit and say, God, be tender towards me, be tender towards me, be so, tender towards me. Yeah, we did an entire episode on contemplative prayer with our mutual friend, Matthew Esquivel. Matthew Esquivel, uh, yes. Yeah, and, and I think that... I loved what who, he had to say. Yeah, so that was just kind of... I give a quick nugget for people who are coming onto this show that have never seen that one. Would you say that there's a, a, there's a primary difference between kind of new age thought um, mm -hmm. and and the kind of meditation of emptying your mind and the Christian view of contemplative prayer, what you're describing as silence? What would, what would you say the primary difference between someone who is in a kind of Eastern tradition trying to meditate by emptying oneself into nothing versus a Christian view of contemplative prayer? Well, I, I think the, the, the revelation of Christianity as a religion is that God is personal. And um, when you look at New Age or Eastern mysticism, God is fairly impersonable. He's unknowable. He's this mysterious essence. He's, he, maybe he's talked about in some... There's, there might be similar language to Scripture, like light and peace and things like that. Um, but it's this real... It's this emptying of yourself to find peace... Um, which fundamentally doesn't jive with what the early church fathers talked about, and it also doesn't jive with what Scripture talks about. The You're not, um, you know, uh, how far off topic to get. I've studied a decent amount of the New Age movement to know how they practice things, and then juxtaposing it with how some of the contemplative literature has communicated uh, what prayer is all about. And one of the fundamental essence one of the fundamental differences is the idea of emptying yourself versus the idea of filling yourself in the new age movement or in Eastern mysticism, you empty yourself to find peace. you you have to divest yourself of all feelings. You have to divest yourself of everything to find peace in, in the desert fathers or in contemplative literature in general. That's only like 5% of it is trying to quell those inner thoughts, but you're quelling the inner thoughts in order to hear the thoughts of God, in order to engage the life of God, in order to be filled with God. It's not a, the, the end goal is not peace and inner stillness. The end goal is having a moment of dialogue with the heart of the Father. And um, you, I mean, you see that so many times throughout the Desert Fathers. Uh, one guy, I think it's Agathon again, says, if a man could just will it, he could become all flame. And it's not about emptying yourself in order to become nothing or to become, um, uh, you know, no longer distracted by the thoughts or anything. That's, that's the practice of 
uh, self-will versus losing your will or dying to your will and and adopting the will of God, adopting the life of God. So, uh, or, hmm. you know, not, you know what I mean? So anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, can I <laughs> go Just ahead, your man. point. Like, I think it's, it's your point. And I'm, I'm only just adding to what you're saying here. Uh, but the idea that the grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Yes. So what you're saying is the, the, um, the uh, kind of mysticism of the new age says i need to empty myself to find peace whereas the christian faith is we need to be centered on christ and focus on christ yes. and then you can't him, find peace without him as we meditate and have knowledge of him yeah. that actually brings peace so it's yeah. not an emptying it's a filling of the knowledge of god that brings that peace so again that's just a scripture to kind of tie on to what you're saying go ahead yeah so when i think about the principle of withdrawing there's a withdrawing from and there's a kind of drawing to and yeah. so we're and we, we've talked a little bit about both sides of that. There's the drawing near to God and the contemplative prayer and the silence and the solitude and all that. Uh, but then you also talked about the way uh, in Roman society and the decadence of it and and just kind of everywhere um, that there was uh, that there was a withdrawing from that. And so. Uh, I'd, I'd like for maybe you to speak into that for a moment, because uh, for us in a contemporary setting, I mean, we live in like the, I mean, okay, so in the West, it's super wealthy <laughs> and super decadent. What does it look like for us to withdraw mm. from this? Yeah, that, and that's a great question. I, I honestly wish there was more opportunity for withdrawal. Um, and, I, and I find... Uh, I was looking for a place, uh, maybe this was about a year ago, uh, to just go and withdraw from the, the daily cares and all that kind of stuff. And I ended up at a monastery that was about an hour and a half drive away from me, mainly because I couldn't find anywhere else. Um, and it's not so much that I have a particular affinity to, to a, whether it's a Catholic monastery or an Orthodox monastery or whatever, it's just that the, the opportunity for withdrawal is, is so it's difficult. I mean, driving 20 minutes in any direction, you are in another town or another city, most of the places that you live, that I've lived anyway. Well, uh, so if so, I could interrupt you for a moment, cause I, I'm yeah. kind of thinking even less about a geographical, like a time place sure. centered withdrawal. Cause there is that, you know, like maybe somebody has got a cabin and the, you know, that they can go to or a friend's cabin or something like that. Yeah. But even the principle of it, I, I'm thinking of revelation 18 when, uh, when it speaks of the judgment upon Babylon and it's speaking specifically of sort of economic Babylon. Mm -hmm. And it says, come out of her, O oh my people, lest you share in her sins and in her plagues. Right. And, and so, I don't know that that means necessarily just ge geographical, but also right. spiritual. And so when you talk about the sort of ethos of the Desert Fathers, I, I mean, on one hand, I do think it's important that we do find a time and a place that we can get away sometimes right. for extended prayer and contemplation. I think that's super important for all of us for our spiritual health. Right. Uh, but then there's kind of like the day in, day out. What does it look like for me to come out of Babylon, so to speak? Yeah, well, that uh, that's a great lead into probably the underpinning of um, what the Desert Fathers taught the spiritual life was all about, and it's really and you'll find them often talking about this this idea of attachment, um, attachment versus detachment, or not versus but attachment and detachment, and and the practice of say for instance fasting, um, or or no, let's go back actually let's go back to solitude. The practice of solitude was to show you all the relational things that you were attached to in order to um, reorient your attachment to the heart of the Father. So when you're in solitude, some of the first things you do is you start thinking about the people that you want around you, mm -hmm. yeah, just practically speaking. Um, you th or you think about, in silence, you think about the, um, the, the tasks that you have, the things that you need to complete. Uh, and oftentimes those things can be uh, connected with, uh, for instance, I remember one time, um, I was struggling with thinking, am I a good father? Am I not? I have three killed three children. So that's something that I'm constantly thinking about is, am I a good father to my children? What do I need to do to, um, to work on this, become a better father, become more loving, all this kind of stuff for my kids. Uh, and so I under, I really understand, um, the seven, five, and two are my kids, so I understand the the difficulty in finding a place of solitude and silence. Um, I was I was sitting down just down here in my chair, right back here, um, just silent before the Lord, and 
I can't even really find it in my mind to think about Jesus, to meditate on scripture or anything. I'm just thinking about all the things I need to do with my kids. And I realize I'm actually thinking about my kids because I'm insecure about the type of father that I am. So that mm -hmm. in those moments of silence, some of the thoughts that had been bubbling underneath the surface begin to percolate. And I can start to see, oh, this is actually some of the stuff that's driving how I think right now. Hmm. And then I can bring that to God in that moment practically and say, God, what do you think about me as a father? Um, how, what do you see that I can change? How can I, how can I adjust? How can I grow? So those, that moment of silence became a really rich moment of hearing the father speak about me as a father. Um, but it was in that, it was in that silence when I didn't have anything going on. I think the kids were, um, I was either early morning or the kids were gone, something like that. Um, that, that some of those insecurities that had been simmering underneath started to bubble up and I was able to actually address them. But when, when we're surrounded by noise, it's so difficult to even process that. I can't tell you how many times my wife says, I, I know all these things, but I just don't have, a, I don't have a moment to actually sit down and think about them and, and think about how to apply them and how to process through them and mm. not having those moments of, of silence and solitude, um, make it very difficult to see what, what it is that's bubbling under the surface. And then for the desert fathers, those things that are bubbling underneath the surface are generally the things that you're attached to. And, and I kind of see that in the, uh, the parable of, um, the wedding feast, when they go out, they say, you know, bring in, uh, bring in the people. And then one person says, well, I've got a new track of land. I can't come in. One person says, I've got a new oxen. I can't come in. One person says, I've just been married. I can't come in. So they've got all these, uh, these, um, people they're attached to, you know, one is this marriage, um, this relational identity that's keeping me from actually engaging, uh, a place of joyfulness before the father, uh, one is I'm a landowner now, so I've got to think about all those types of things. I own something. I've got to think about this. I've got some prestige now. I can't come into this place with the father, even though I'm invited there. Uh, one of them is I've got these possessions that I've got to take care of. They're driving me. They're driving my needs. They're driving my wants. They're the very thing that I own. Uh, and, I, and it precludes me from being able to have this moment with the father. So I'm attached to all of these, and those are fundamentally destroying my ability to attach to the heart of the father. Uh, and so in silence and solitude, you actually expose the attachments. Fasting exposes the, the things you're attached to by desire. Uh, and I can begin to reorient and attach to the heart of the Father. So some of the disciplines were about um, uh, disconnecting and some of them were about connecting. So you got prayer and remembrance of God is one of the, one of the ones um, that's very integral to them. And that's about uh, being in the name of Jesus um, a lot of it was saying the name of Jesus repeatedly to imprint the name of Jesus on your heart so that at any given moment, your heart is constantly crying out for Jesus. It's a, it's trained repetition essentially at that so point. With, so we've talked in the beginning, we've talked about like, okay, who, these are the desert fathers. These are who they are. Um, these are some of the practices that they believe that have been helpful. We've kind of talked about that up into this point saying, Hey, yep. you know, uh, contemplation, isolation, uh, uh, these kinds of uh, exercises of theirs are helpful and, and should be probably something that we should practice on some level. Uh, yeah. Help me understand what are some of the areas and are there areas that they just went off the deep end and we shouldn't follow? Yeah, what, absolutely. what are areas when, you know, you start reading some of the ancients, you know, it's hard as a Protestant because you're like, it's all or nothing, right? We have this all or nothing right. culture. Politically, I have to completely believe this person and everything yeah. that they do, or I throw them all out. You know, is how do we read these desert fathers if they've got some kind of weirdness going on? And so, so first of all, was there weirdness, and then what do we do with it if there was? Yeah, absolutely. And and you had, um, we'll say, two levels of weirdness because you had the practice of weirdness, and then you had some of the um, unorthodox beliefs in terms mm -hmm. of. You know, you guys just talked about the uh, with Matthew Escovel, the, the Council of Chalcedon or Chalcedon um, and uh, and nailing down some of the is Jesus God, is Jesus man. What how do we divide that? How do we understand that? Um, you had some guys that were diametrically opposed to that. Longinus uh, being one of them, Abba, Abba being one of the technical terms or the, the um, terms of endearment, not technical terms that they used throughout the period was Abba and Amma for mother and father. So you had Abba Longinus, who was a respected teacher and a notable figure, but absolutely opposed to the Council of Chalcedon. Um, and uh, so you've got some guys that were on the heresy side, never recanted his her heretical beliefs, 
firmly opposed um, the uh, and and some of, it's funny when you read some of the the stories about their life because the disciples that wrote their stories wanted to uh, venerate their father. They would write about how evils the evils of Cal- of Chalcedon they, the evils of um, not understanding the nature of Jesus all this kind of stuff those are you know to the victor go the spoils because those are the guys that aren't really remembered. Um, yeah, so anyway, you had some of the guys that were on the on the losing side of the theological debate. Um, there's one story where uh, some some people that are involved in the Arian belief, which hadn't quite been condemned, it was in on, in the midst of being condemned at this point. Um, and uh, Abba Sissos, who was the disciple of Abba Anthony, uh, he's he's having this dialogue with these Arians, and he tells one of his disciples, "Well, just go get Athanasius's book against the Arians, and read that out loud." And so that's their whole way of refuting the Arians, who are mona- who are monastic practices uh, practicers that had come for wisdom. So you had some some of the clashing happening in the Desert Fathers over some of those theological divides. Um, uh, so you definitely had people that believed unorthodox um, theological positions and then adhered to them later. Uh, but that's that's really obvious when you talk about early church fathers, because you had some guys on, I mean, the, the large body of them on the right side of the fence, and then you had guys on the wrong side of the fence. Um, now, you can get down into some of the practices where people went to the extreme. So uh, one of the things that happens by the time you get to Cassian at the end of the fourth century, and, and the reason I mentioned Cassian a number of times is he really uh, codified the practice of the Desert Fathers for Western civilization. Uh, he spent about 10 years or so traveling amongst the Desert Fathers and interviewing them and, and put together. He wrote a rule of life. He wrote, um, recounted all the uh, interviews he had with these fathers and and really communicated to the West how they practiced the life. Um and and systematized the 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 way that they um, practiced the spiritual life. So anyway, Cassian, when he talks about the idea of withdrawal and retreat, he basically says, if your reason for withdraw before withdrawal is to get away from people, you're doing it wrong. Um, he says, uh, your the community of people is to mold you and shape you. If you haven't walked through the fire of learning to love one another, then when you remove yourself to the desert, you're just going to make it worse for yourself. So the only person that should withdraw into the desert would be the person that's spiritually mature in order to seek Christ so that when they come back, they have something to give to the community. And so you had this correction there because they had so many people that were just going into the desert and getting lost or dying because they'd practiced uh, extreme fasting, uh, not eating anything or any, or anything like that. Um, the amount of times there's a story of them finding a dead body in a cave because some desert father had, or some father or some person that was trying to practice the spiritual life had died because of the, how they practice the spiritual life. Uh, that those stories are fairly commonplace. So you do have these excesses that began to be corrected, but people still practiced in extreme ways. You had one guy, um, St. Simeon, the stylite, you may have heard of him. One of the first, he was the first pillar dweller, uh, oh, which yeah. became, yes. Yeah, so Simeon, the stylite would be a desert father. Um, he started off the very first discipline he started to enact when he got involved with the monastic community was underneath the robe that he was wearing. He tied a rope too tightly around him until it ate away at his flesh and he got really sick because of it. And he was thinking he's killing his flesh. And the fathers come around him and they're going, what are you doing? So they chastised him and correct him. He just, I mean, the picture of it's disgusting because it started to rot away his flesh. Um, uh, and then he goes off. It's hard des- to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like, so uh, I, I, you know, sometimes you read this stuff and you're going anyway, <laughs> I won't talk about the word picture. So that- <laughs> this is a question I'm sure you get asked all the time. How does yeah. like early church, they're, constantly being accused and, and like i see all the time people saying hey early church fathers they were they were so involved with platonic thought platonic thought was so right. like affected the way that they they looked at life 
Um, and, and for those who are watching Plato, kind of Gnostic thinking of or the sure. earthly, the fleshly is carnal, it's bad, you know, the spiritual is good. How did that play out? In, in your studies, do you see yeah. that they're guilty of kind of this, this early Gnostic or proto-Gnostic view of, of the spiritual life, that the earthly, the fleshly is carnal, so let's just abstain from food, abstain from society, because those things don't matter, and they're carnal, and they're going to pull us away into sin. We're just going to like... We're just going to sit in our room and pray. Like, do, do you see a connection there, um, or, or is that just kind of a straw man? No, I, there's definitely a connection there. They, yep. they're, the northern Egypt, where they were centralized, wasn't, it was like 10 miles away from Alexandria. Yeah. And Alexandria was the school of thought. Um, I mean, mainly, mainly, I mean, in terms of theology, the catalyst was Clement of Alexandria. Uh, but then Origen, you get into, um, and... You had a lot of uh, Neoplatonic philosophy influencing the thought life of of Alexandria. So you do see that. The problem with nailing down a theological conception of the Desert Fathers is, one, like I said, they didn't write a whole lot about Mm. theology. They just wrote about—I mean, like I said, this is the the main bulk, and it's just just short little sayings. Like— if you can even see that, if it focuses on, it's just yeah. short little mm-hmm. sayings. They're not really. There's nothing really long in the stuff that they're talking about. And even Anthony, with Anthony the Great, the the biggest bulk of literature that we have for him is one in here, and then two in a series of I think it's 13 letters he wrote to his disciples. So it's these are desert tweets. Writing. These aren't treatises. Yeah, these desert. are like these are <laughs> yeah. these are desert <laughs> tweets. Yeah, That's yeah, what you're saying. So 140 impactful. characters. 140 characters or less. No more. So, like uh, Agathon, he said that if I could exchange my body with that of a leper, that would make me happy, for that indeed would be perfect love. Oof. You know, that's a great uh. tweet. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's powerful for sure. It's very <laughs> Christian. It's a powerful statement that makes you, th- makes you think, and that's one of the things I love about them. Um, and so, but you do find, especially in, in, I think you really find it culminating in Maximus the Confessor. Um, is this real heavy handed, the body is bad, creation is bad, you're to be spiritual, all of these things are to choke out the life of the body. You find that pretty consistent. I mean, I like Maximus the Confessor. He says some pretty incredible things. Um, And you can't really fault a guy that had his tongue cut out and his hand cut off um, all for defending Orthodox Trinitarian theology. So it's hard hard to condemn a guy for that. Um, but you definitely find some of that Neoplatonic thought, not so much as it pertains to what they thought about the nature of Jesus, um, because I, it, it, when you look at Neoplatonism, and someone who knows Neoplatonism better than I can correct me if I'm wrong, but... Um, we were saying proto, idea, proto-Platonism, right? Like before uh, the Platonic thought or Gnostic thought came into being. It's not new, it's, it's right, right. right before it kind of... So like proto, right? Would that be the right... Pro, no, I've, not, I've not actually heard the term proto-Platonism. So I've, heard, I've, I've heard of like proto-Gnosticism, which is like before right. Gnosticism was full-blown Gnostic. I'm just assuming okay. that that's the, the, the correct descriptor of it. But well, even, in, just, totally even in just in, in my studying of Platonic thought, um, the idea of God is still immaterial and vague. Right, 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 right. He's not identified or defined. And sure. so you, you do have a decent amount of Platonic language. And I know a lot of people in like to connect Plotinus as a philosopher with some of the early church fathers, because and especially Augustine uses language that sounds Neoplatonic. Um, but none of them root their, uh, root their understanding of God in him. If they ever say he's a mystery, they go on to say how much he's explained himself. Yeah. So he's not immaterial. He's not unknowable, as, as, in, as you would find more in Platonic thought. And so, he's not this vague, immaterial thing, even though there's a God, he's the one, he's the prime mover, all this stuff. He's firmly rooted in the scriptural account and firmly rooted in the communication of that. So the Desert Fathers, they're not necessarily, they, their theology isn't necessarily influenced by the Platonic thought or Neoplatonism or Protoplatonism, but some of their practices of the body is bad, the creation is bad, and so we need to do things to kill that. I mean, Simon, Simeon the Stylite, the next thing he did after tiling the rope around him was he went to a mountain and chained himself to a rock so that when the weather came, he'd have to succumb to the weather in order to kill his body, basically. Like, I, like shouldn't the Desert Fathers have stepped in sooner? 
Like, they did, well, I they mean, did, on day two they, that you've got a rope tied around you, or like day three that you're chained to like some giant what pole, whatever it was. I'm like, get some friends on this guy <laughs> and just be like, talk him off the ledge, like literally. Would so you so step back got- from that ledge, my so friend? It, there are systemic <laughs> issues in the Desert Father community. <laughs> There's systemic problems, Josh. So with, with Simeon, hey. he, Simeon hid the rope. Okay. So nobody he hit hit the rope. Nobody knew. He hit the rope. No one knew. I kick happening. him out, so, man. It started to smell it. Oh, that's, I'd be that's, like, that's how you happened. harm your body, you're out of here, man. It's not what we do. So, but, by the time Simeon built a pillar and said, "I'm now I'm getting up on this pillar to get away," the their the fathers in the area send a coalition to him right away to correct him. Oh, good for and them. And they say to him the very first thing they've caught wind that he's doing this, so they send a group of people to him and say, "Okay, say this to him, Simeon, come down." If Simeon agrees to come down, we'll know he's submissive. You know, thinking about your talk on authority in tomorrow, I think you were saying, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thus Simeon, says the Lord. Say, if Simeon will come down, we know he's submissive. And if he's submissive, we can be more rest assured that he's listening to God. Mm. If he rails against you, come back and tell us because we need to get more extreme about this. Wow. And so when they mm. went to him and they said, Simeon, come down, because they knew Simeon. They knew he had been extreme in the past. And so they were already concerned about him. But when they said Simeon come down, Simeon immediately came down and they said, okay, if he's willing to submit to people that would be conceivably beneath him because they were just disciples sent to correct him, then he's truly humble at this point. We trust him. Um, Get back up on that thing, Simeon. So yeah, so so got back up. I I need help from our audience for this next question. Uh, Like these names, like Maximus the Confessor. I would like uh, names. I would like you guys to name uh, Michael and I both uh, (laughs) with some kind of ridiculous satirical name, like Josh the Ignorant or something. Like really get creative with it, and we'll vote on Facebook. (laughs) Like you really want you want it to be mean? Oh, not mean necessarily, (laughs) but satirical for sure. Josh the Terrible. How about how about Josh, you could be right in line uh, with Abba John. He was John the Short. Oh, that'll, that'll, oh, <laughs> short tempered maybe. Um, no, okay. So, 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 I want those in the live chat. The best live chat suggestion oh, gets on good. Facebook, and we'll we'll vote on it later. I think it'll be fun. It'll be a fun little game. I was thinking and, about it. And you were yeah. talking. What was one of the names that you used? That one of the first guys in the middle. Uh, what was his name? He had a ridiculous name. I was like, was Lord Voldemort already taken? Like, it was a, it was an intense name. <laughs> no. um, I linked over to Michael. Josh, and I was like, Josh man, whispered I was like, that to me. Yeah, I was like, it's okay. No, okay. Uh, <laughs> so their names are super cool. There's some I'm great names, yeah. Really true. jealous. Cool names. Um, a closing thoughts. This is one of the things that we do at the end of all of our programs is we ask our guests to come on and say, hey, uh, what are some thoughts? If people are walking away, what are things that they want uh, really to dig into the Desert Fathers? And I want you in this kind of period as well to remind people about these things. Uh, they're super, oh, yes. super cool. I highly recommend them. I think they're they're really neat. They're kind of devotional books that Josh wrote. So I'd actually got, ask you guys to kind of uh, uh, pick those up. Shoot me a link so I can put that in the description of this video. That would be super yeah, helpful. Yeah, I will. I will. Um, um, I've already been called St. Michael the Bearded. Yes! St. <laughs> Michael the Debearded would be pretty good. The Debearded. Be uh, the, be... as- the Aspiringly Bearded. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Th- these are going to be good. I'm really looking forward to these. Okay, uh, Josh, tell us, uh, uh, what is one thing that you really want everyone walking away with? Hey, uh, make sure that you you study this about the Desert Fathers and, and apply this to your life because it will benefit you. And then tell people how to get in contact with you in your ministry and pick up some of these books and materials and resources that you've produced. Yeah, well, I mean, specifically with those books, my whole goal in writing those was to make it simple to engage the life of uh, what the early church fathers taught. And I I think as a final thought, I'd just say, um, take a moment to recollect on your life in God. Take a moment to look at the types of things that you implement on a daily basis to know the Father's heart. How are you practicing knowing his heart Um, if I was to ask you, what is his heart for you and how are you aware of his heart for you? And when was the last time, um, you were consciously aware of a plan for you or that you were part of his narrative or that you were part of his story or that you were part of something greater than just your, the, the humdrum of everyday life. Um, I would say start, start, you don't have to start big. Start small, start implementing rhythms in your life to know his heart, to, to know who he is, to know, to hear his voice, uh, to seek his face, you know, like, like, uh, Psalm 27, four, seek my face, my face, your heart, seek my heart, 
seek my face, your heart longs to know me, that kind of stuff, that Scripture is full of examples of the Father inviting you into an intimate place. And the Desert Fathers help to give some structure to what that looks like, but it's not about just... So I think in our, in our Christian religiosity, we've said, I do these things because it's part of the spiritual life, but you don't do those things because they're part of the spiritual life. You do those things to move you in a place where you, where you can receive from the Father, where you can hear from the Father, where you can be impacted by the Father. The spiritual life is not about being disciplined. The mm. spiritual life is about being transformed and structuring your life in a way. If you don't plan for transformation, it's not going to happen. You're going to be stuck in the same patterns, stuck in the same rhythms. But if you begin to implement routines in your life to introduce you to the heart of God, things will begin to shift. It might be minuscule and it might be small, but that's better than just being stuck. And so my, my challenge is do an honest assessment of yourself. How can you adapt your routine throughout your day to encounter the life of God? And that really is the principle of the monastic life when you look at it throughout Christian history is putting together a rule of life that helps give you structure to seek the face of God on a daily basis because prayer is not about the the 10 minutes, the hour, the two hours in the morning. It's about a life lived with your heart turned towards God. And anytime your heart's turned away, when you're sensitized to his, to his presence, you're sensitive to his voice, it's about recognizing when my heart hasn't turned to him, turn my heart to him. It's simple. Mm-hmm. Prayer is a heart turn and the disciplines discipline you to keep your heart in that place. And so I just I just bless you with the grace to engage the spiritual journey and to know the heart of God. Wow. That was good. That was dope. It was very good. Um we, we the the whole the whole I don't know if you could hear online like the studio the studio mm yeah like that was like they they drank something real tasty like oh yeah mhm mhm yeah we got lots of amens got a hanky wave it was good. Uh <laughs> thrilled with it. You got some closing thoughts? Michael? Uh sure. Yeah. So I, I just thought of a quote. I, I wouldn't call this like a summary thought per se, but just kind of something that adds to the discussion. Uh, old kind of mathematician, philosopher, scientist guy, uh, Blaise Pascal, French dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the he's, mathematician, right? Yeah, he says yeah, he was a math. He was everything. The father. He's a, uh, is he the father of the math, modern math? Uh, he he invented math. He invented the math. No, <laughs> no, he did. Uh, he did something pretty significant with yeah. The Pascal didn't he do a triangle? Pascal's yeah, triangle. Yeah. Hmm? He invented, he invented trigonometry. Invented trigono- try, oh. try trigonometry. There Sorry, you go. You. So, uh, Blaise Pascal, he said this, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I saw that kind of being tweeted around and passed around during, especially when coronavirus and the quarantine really started. Is, mm. And there are all these studies coming out that were like, people are terrible at sitting quietly in a room alone. And then people would be like, Pascal says you're terrible. Look, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and honestly, I'm not making light of the whole mental health crisis, which is super, mm-hmm. super real yeah. and uh, real. devastating. But um, but what I am saying is that there is something, and Josh, you were, you were really kind of touching on this, I think, a lot, which was there's something about being alone, completely alone, just yeah. with your thoughts that allows those attachments to surface that sometimes are yeah. unhealthy attachments mm-hmm. so that you can deal with them. And so I, I just think that's... Yeah. Uh, that's such a helpful practice that it's not just getting alone so that there are fewer, you know, for the sake of getting alone and not just right. because it's a spirit, but it's actually so that you can allow your thoughts to come to the surface, your true self, so yeah. that you can bring your true self to God. When, when was the last time you were in contact with your insecurity? Yeah, so like that, like the the idea that that America wants to stay so busy, so yeah, uh, we, like we don't even want to be alone with ourselves. We're gonna scroll through Facebook and give us ourselves more depression by looking how great everyone else's life is. Yeah, uh, man, that that checks out. It makes a ton of sense. Uh, yeah, uh, one of those questions: How do we get this stuff? Where do we pick it up? Yes, yes. So you can find those on my website, windministries.ca, and you just click the little button that says shop. W I N D, not win, as in you won something. Uh, but you will win something. You will win the path to God. So uh, windministries.ca, you can find the books there. Uh, you can find um, the, I wrote another book called The Dark Night of Spiritual Struggles. 
Uh, you can find that one on Amazon actually as a Kindle book, but you can also find that on the website. Uh, so that book, The Dark Night of Spiritual Struggles, was trying to take what I saw throughout Christian history, people describing similar experiences of feeling the withdrawal of God's presence and the effect that that had upon them. Uh, so that book is dedicated to anybody that's gone through a dry season and helping them to find closure or reasons for why they went through that. So you can find that on Amazon. You can find that on the website. Um, there, we do have some a um, a shipper in the states uh, that is the secret is it's my sister. Um, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 but there's only a few left to be shipped in the states. The rest of them okay. are in Canada, um, and so. But you can get them on the website there. Uh, you can find you can find the writings on the Desert Fathers at thedesertfathers.ca. Uh, so thedesertfathers.ca that'll show you all 52 articles that I wrote about the Desert Fathers. Um, those would work as great devotionals too. But those are seven day devotionals designed to introduce you to each day a principle that one of the Desert Fathers uh, uh, touched on, talked about. Um, those types of things, impactful statements coupled with scripture, with some short writings and some prayerful thoughts to consider afterwards. Uh, on the website, I think they're ten dollars Canadian. Yeah, they're not. They're not expensive. Yeah, no, they're not. Uh, and I actually, we were doing. If you're in Canada, we we're we're still doing it because as long as the lockdown lasts, we're doing free shipping. So mm -hmm. if you buy the bulk of, if you buy all five of them, you get the last one free. So it's forty plus free shipping uh, in Canada. I can't afford to do that to the states. I heard that. No, okay. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. We're on tomorrow uh, talking about authority. Uh, and then we've got other episodes uh, next week. Uh, the Will of God. Uh, we'll be discussing that. I'm going to be in Virginia. I'll be the one Skyping in. It'll be a blast, man. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you guys be praying for us as we are traveling throughout the states. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. Uh, and if you have any subjects that you want us to cover in the future, you can actually email me at uh, media at theremnantradio.com. That's media at theremnantradio.com. A lot of people have been uh, messaging us on Facebook, which is fine. Uh, but man, if you want to, hey, we want this guest to come on. We want this subject to come on. Uh, we're always open and interested in our our audience's suggestions. So you guys actually listen to more people than we do. Uh, so 